Hi, my name is Rui José from University of Minho, and as General Chair, I am delighted to welcome you all to the International Conference on IoT in Urban Space 2020. The Urban IoT Conference provides a multidisciplinary forum for addressing the scientific and industrial challenges associated with smart cities. I hope you can all enjoy the exchange of ideas and the discussions we will have today. As General Chair, I cannot go without a word to all the people who have been involved in the preparation of this conference. I'll start by the steering chairs, Professor, Professor Imrik Schlamtag and Professor Faim Kavzar, as well as the General Chairs of Smart City 360, Professors Sergio Savarezi, Enrique Sanj and Sara Paiva. A special thanks go also to our uh, convention manager, Carolina Marcinova, for all the work in the small issues that are always involved in the preparation of a conference like this. I would also like to thank our own organizing committee team of Urban IT here at University of Minho, and especially to my general co-chair, Professor Helena Rodrigues. And also the technical program committee and all the additional reviewers who have made the hard work of going through all the submissions and preparing the high quality technical program we will have today. I'll especially like to thank Professor Takuru Yonezava, who is our program chair, for uh, conducting this process and bringing us here today. Finally, um, thank you all for submitting your papers for presenting today. This conference is made for you, but it's also made by you, by your work, by your presentations, and I hope you all enjoy the session today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EAI OBIOT 2020 conference held in this virtual interactive setting. I am Elena Davidova and I would like to address all of you on behalf of EAI and OBIOT 2020. I would like to use this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the authors and all the participants on behalf of all of us here at EAI. I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this conference and for your involvement with EAI. In particular, I would like to thank the General Chairs Rui Jose and Helena Rodriguez and the Program Chair Takuro Yonizawa together with the whole organizing committee for their excellent work during the conference preparation. Today, during this streaming, we would like to invite you to participate in the Q&A sessions during each video, please write your questions about the current presentation into the chat window. After the presentation is done, the session chair will ask selected questions to the author of the presentation in a live conversation. Lastly, I'd like to use this message to invite you to join us again at the AI Urban IoT 2021. Should you be more interested in becoming a part of the next year's conference, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email address below. Similarly, if you are interested in discussing other possible cooperation, a conference, a workshop or a new event altogether, please contact us at this email address as well. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the conference EAI Urbio T 2020. My name is Michal Dudic, I'm the Committee Manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EEI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are non-profit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. 
We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EEI Compass, Community Review, and EEI Index. Firstly, EEI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EEI Compass website, compass.eei.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with Community Review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019, and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the Community Review. Let's talk briefly about what Community Review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course, and all EEI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EEI members and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks – senior member, distinguished member, or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we will look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon. Hello, my name is Afra Mashadi and I'm an assistant professor of computer science of University of Washington. 
Uh, today I'm presenting on behalf of uh, two of my students, Edward Kim and Joshua Sterner. Uh, our paper is about crowdsourcing obstacle detection and navigation app for visually impaired. I'm sure that you have seen many exciting uh, works and papers that has been published in this version of Urban IoT in 2020. And today our work is going to take a different angle and look at a subset of users, citizens, who, uh, who have different criteria and difficulties when they're navigating across the city. So we are looking at inclusion and diversity within the context of smart cities. So let's just give a little bit of a background. Uh, in 2016, there was a report, a uh, large survey done by Royal Institute of Blind People in the United Kingdom, and they surveyed uh, many different people from different communities who uh, suffered from either blindness or partially sighted. And uh, they have looked at how long it takes for them to navigate their local neighborhood, what kind of places they go to. And for example, when they go to work, when they go to the local shops and, this, uh, and the uh, GP, what kind of risks they might be running into. And the result of that survey high, really highlighted that there are daily obstacles, temporary obstacles that appear in our sidewalks that as people without uh, impairment, we just walk through them and we navigate them easily, but they have quite a big impact on the partially sighted people. So this report concludes that uh, in 95% of the cases of 500 users that they interviewed, um, there were objects such as advertising boards, street furniture, uh, shared spaces, and so on that actually highly impacted their local um, navigation, their daily routines. And uh, most of the time, 95% of the cases, it actually led to serious injuries. And we are not talking about uh, lack of resources, for example, trained dogs and so on. But we are talking about even having those resources, how partially sighted people could be highly impacted by the obstacles in the sidewalks. And I want you to also think about, as we are now going through this pandemic and uh, we have seen our cities have transformed, we have seen a lot of local businesses expanding to the sidewalks outside of their restaurants and cafes just to be able to accommodate for social distancing. I want you to think about what impact this has on journeys that partially sighted people need to make and how, they, how their navigation around the city can be impacted by this. So um, as part of the report, Royal Institute of Blind People uh, sent a, a set of guidelines for the UK government, which some of them can be actually turned into law, and some of them are already law and regulations, for example, regarding the licensed areas of coffee shops and so on for the street furniture. But some other categories of them are really about working with citizens, working with local blind and partially sighted people to be able to monitor and mitigate the impact of any of these temporary obstacles that are around. And we were really uh, inspired by this dimension of this report. And we decided, uh, my student Edward Kim decided to build an app which would be helping the users to navigate through the city. So the app is called GeoNotify. You would see a, a short demo of that app by Edward. But uh, the main important goals and objective of our app was that we want to help create a database of temporary obstacles uh, by using crowdsourcing, by relying on the users themselves. We want to be able to route users um, enabling them to avoid any kind of an obstacle by giving them a navigation route that uh, reroutes them through the obstacle. And then finally, we want to be able to help the 
user to identify the obstacles that are around, uh, given that our app is designed for the um, visually impaired, uh, partially sighted uh, users. So in general, we have three functionalities in our app embedded. One is navigation, which relies on Google Maps platform. We have the assist uh, part component, which helps to identify objects. And then we have the reporting component, which uh, has the uh, AI embedded uh, object detection in, in that uh, part of it. And everything is hosted on Amazon Cloud Servers and Solutions, and um, it has a live interactions with the all uh, components of the Geo Notify. Regarding the design of the app itself, we, dis we uh, designed for accessibility. We followed the previous guidelines about utilizing the whole screen and to maximize on the space for each button. Um, with the maximize the space, we also use large letters and uh, we made sure we use a black background and white text to help with the uh, visibility of that. Uh, we also use a dark mode, as is suggested by the previous works on this domain. And uh, to make it easier for mild to moderate visually impaired to read text, uh, we also um, have the everywhere throughout the app, we have the functionality of a speech feedback. So any of our screens can be, uh, can be actually read out loud to the user. Um, to navigate the application, the user just taps a button to choose an option, or they can swipe right to go back to the previous screen. Um, and again, we provide a voice navigation button, which allows the user to just use their voice in order to navigate the app, and they don't need to actually um, read anything. Um, with that, I'm going to show you a short demo of our app before going deeper into the different components of our model. Okay, start my app. Home screen. All right, so this is GeoNotify home screen. Before we begin, we have to turn on some settings. Uh, first of all, the voice feedback Control settings. voice output. And then um, to, to track the movement. Monitor movement. Now, now. let's test let's the real-time real object recognition. Assist screen. Assist screen. Describe object. object. And construction. construction. That orange cone. cone. It'll, it'll tell you. No walking no sign. sign. No walking no sign. sign. Now, let's, let's test the test. read sign. Read sign. Read sign. Road closed to through traffic. Okay. So now that we have a system, let's go to report. New report and screen. Before we start the report, let's check the map, map screen. Make sure it's empty before we begin. As you can see here, there are no red flags that show that there are any issues the moment. So New report screen. Issues. Report by picture. Construction. To create a new report, you just tap. Construction. Upload successful. Okay. So now you can go. Map screen. Check if it updated. Construction is 68 centimeters away and known. Construction is 68 yeah, centimeters issues. away and known. Let's see if I can tap it. There you go. Construction. So you can see that uploaded to the database, and by going to navigate, we pulled that issue. 
and that's what this notification service does. It pulls the issue based on your location from the database. Now let's try recording by speech. New report screen. To report by speech, go to report. You tap and hold. Report by report. voice. And you say what the object is. For example, orange cone. And you can go to navigate. And we will see construction in orange cone. That is how you report by speech. For UI voice navigation, we provided uh, on every screen the voice button. You just tap and hold and you say a command of what you want to do. So for example, assist screen. Assist. Home. Report by picture. So that is the voice navigation. All right, so let's get back to our presentation. Thank you, Edward. So this was just a short demo to show you how we have the navigation and the obstacle detection, which comes from the crowdsourced information. Um, in the demo, you what you saw was mostly the applications of uh, OCR. So it was reading the text. However, uh, as part of our app, we are using uh, image recognition in order to be able to uh, upload the type of obstacles that are uh, currently in the sidewalk. Um, one challenge that came after implementation of our model uh, of our app was that um, how does our model actually perform with the real images uh, of objects, of obstacles? And uh, with this, I mean, really diversity that we encounter in the real world setting. This is our pictures uh, of post boxes in some of the countries that I lived. And obviously, uh, when we train a machine learning algorithm, it will learn what we are giving it as an input. So unless it has seen a diverse representation of the real world object, its uh, accuracy on identifying them would not be as well um, good enough. So we actually performed uh, comparison of two of the state-of-the-art lightweight image detection um, uh, models, which are MobileNet version 2 and SqueezeNet. Both of them are suitable for running on the mobile phone uh, and uh, while being extremely powerful in uh, detecting objects. These models are pre-trained on ImageNet dataset. And we try to measure what is the accuracy of them when we apply them to this type of objects that we are interested in based on the Royal Institute of Blind People report. So these five categories of objects. And here we could see that the accuracy level is actually very low. So even though they've been trained on um, type of representations of these objects, they do not actually have the kind of the domain that we are interested in to tackle for this problem. So we asked ourselves, if we are to rely on a large amount of diverse data images from across the world, can we crowdsource this task and ask people to train these object recognition models, object detection models? And if we want to do that, then how much data do we need? Obviously, we don't want to ask every person, every citizen to take thousands and thousands of photos of their <laughs> beans and uh, other type of objects around them, but we want to know how would it perform if we do get um, 
these kind of objects from the users, from the citizens. So we pick five categories uh, of these obstacles from the report, and uh, we collect a diverse set of images uh, that we can actually help uh, to, we can use in order to um, improve the model's uh, mobile net and squeezedness. So in order to do that, um, we use transfer learning approaches. So we have a model which has been pre-trained on ImageNet classes. So it's well capable of um, detecting ImageNet classes. And then what we do is that we take this model and we basically freeze the earlier layers of these models, which are the convolutions and pooling uh, layers, and we freeze them such that in the retraining it, it the weights of these layers would not change. Um, but we extract the feature from the uh, fully connected from these layers into the, uh, into the new model that we want to build and we retrain the pink portion of the model, which is the fully connected layers, in order to learn these new classes that we are interested in. So now we want to make sure our model works well with these new classes of objects that are of our interests. And we do the same for mobile net and squeeze net. We uh, use the pre-trained image net and then we retrain them on these um, five classes uh, using transfer learning. So uh, regarding on how much data we would need, uh, we do a couple of different experiments. Uh, we look at what if we have 100 images per class? What if we have only as little as 10 images per class or 20 images per each class? for both mobile net and squeeze net. And we can see that obviously the more images we have, the better the model is able to learn faster the representations of these objects. But even with as little as 20 images, we can see that uh, after a few uh, epochs of training, we are actually able to have a decent um, accuracy of detecting those, those images. We next looked at another aspect of another challenge of our work. So uh, when we talk about diversity and when we talk about including people, crowdsourcing this task to uh, normal citizens to help us improve this model, we also need to think about the participation burden and also the privacy aspects of things. So we wanted to know how can we actually reduce this participation burden, not only in the terms of how many photos are needed to be uh, used for the train retraining of the models, but also in terms of not sharing those uh, outside of the device itself. So what if I want to be able to keep my privacy and participate in improving this AI model, but I do not want to send any photos to the um, to the to any uh, uh, outside servers. So we started looking at the federated learning approaches uh, where you have a federated server which uh, already has a model which has been pre-trained, in this case for us, mobile net and a squeeze net which are being pre-trained. And the server is in charge of sending the model to each device and rather than the device sending the photo to our server and us doing a, a centralized training. In this case, the server actually sends the model to each device. Each device does one round of training based on their own photos, and they just send the updated weight of the model back to the server. The server aggregates these new weights together and sends the model, the aggregated model now for another round of training. So everything is actually done on the mobile phone itself and with the current technologies of the uh, mobile devices, this is a trend that is becoming much more possible than it was a couple of years ago. So by following these uh, principles of focus, data collection and minimization, we rely on the users to contribute to these building these models such that it works 
for them. So we don't actually have a one version of a smart cities for everybody, but people contribute to make the model learn the representation of their cities. Um, our implementation is using PySift, which is a federated learning library for PyTorch. And uh, for implementing MobileNet and SqueezeNet, we used uh, PyTorch libraries. And we used the optimizations of a stochastics uh, gradient descent as well. So in terms of the experimentation, we vary the number of workers and we vary the number of images per each class. And however, we assume that in this case, data is uniformly distributed, so every person who is participating in training these models has the same number of images as everybody else and uh, uniformly across the classes of the data as well. And uh, finally, uh, we assume that our um, federated learning is synchronous. So all the mob mobiles are training at the same time. Uh, there are different versions of asynchronous training, but in this case of our preliminary experiments, we were just uh, interested into looking at the, uh, the synchronous version of training of these models. So here are some of our results for uh, MobileNet. Um, the figure on the left shows when we have 100 images per each class and uh, the no different colors uh, annotate the different number of workers. So 20 workers, 10 workers, or five workers. So the more the no number of the workers that we have involved, the more people who are participating in training the model, obviously it takes longer for the accuracy to, to, to uh, improve and get better due to the fact that uh, there are aggregations between them and then the model has to be trained another round and so on. Um, the one on the right, the figure on the right of the uh, slide shows when we have 20 images per, per, uh, per classes, per one of those five classes. So um, you can see that in this case, accuracy is lower and uh, all of these figures show the maximum validation accuracy uh, when we did a five-fold uh, cross-validation. So again, a consistent trend of when we have larger number of participants being involved, it takes longer for the model to be trained. However, having said that, it means that each one of those participants needs to contribute less amount of information into training that model. So less number of photos in this case. Here are the similar results for the SqueezeNet. We observe a pretty much similar trend as before. So again, having only uh, five participants and 10 participants uh, with a few rounds of training, we can have, we can improve the accuracy of these models, the squeeze net and mobile net to be somewhere around 85% in identifying these objects that it did not know about it based on the ImageNet pre-training. Uh, with that, uh, my talk is being concluded. Some of the future directions we are interested in working on includes performing a user study of GeoNotify. We never uh, got to do that because the pandemic uh, started uh, back in the winter and that was around the time that we had finalized the app. So that's one thing that we still uh, need to do. And then um, in general, our longer objective of my research lab is to uh, look at inter interpretable uh, machine learning algorithms and human-centric AI. So can we actually involve people in training of the AI uh, in order to make sure that the models and algorithms are diverse, they account for diversity and inclusion? And um, we want to expand our current model that we have for federated learning model to be able to learn a broader category of smart city objects. And not only in terms of um, 
larger number of classes, but also in terms of their diversity across the world. So having participants from across the world to actually be part of our projects. And that is something that I'm uh, very interested in the direction that we are working on with my uh, research team. And if you're interested in getting involved uh, in this work, please uh, contact me. Uh, visit our webpage uh, of Ubicom webpage to see the kind of work we are doing with the uh, federated learning and um, diversity of participation and um, email me if you have any questions regarding this talk. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, we are going to present an ecosystem approach to the design of sensing systems for bicycles. Smart cycling is a very broad concept encompassing the many paths through which cycling is being incorporated into the connected and smart transport networks of the future. It can be described as the shared real-time and collaborative application of data, communication technologies, products and services through both private and public actors to help best move people individually and collectively across the urban environment. The application of free information technologies in this domain is already a dom dom dominant factor for the su successful adoption of shared bicycles, where they provide some of the collective features that characterize those services, such as the ability to find nearby bicycles or seamless pay per use. We can envision the evolution of this paradigm, with increasingly more bicycles being instrumented in ways that can add value to the entire ecosystem. In this study, we analyze the role that bicycles equipped with sensors, processing capabilities and communications might have as a valuable source of data about personal and collective reality of urban cycling. Sensing systems for bicycles have been explored in many different ways, but the key assumption is always the design of a closed system where a uniform set of bicycles with a concrete set of sensors is used to support a specific service. Regardless of the technical merits of any particular system, the larger challenge is how to generalize sensing approaches so that they can be collectively uh, supported by many heterogeneous bicycles, owned by a multitude of entities and operated under a common ecosystem of cycling data. This is a problem that goes beyond the existence of a single plat platform or the usage of standard protocols for data representation. It also involves the data collection procedures, the types of sensors used, data processing algorithms, the operation of sensors or even the details of how the sensors are deployed on the bicycles. Closed systems lack the generalization that is needed to allow different designs to be explicitly expressed in a way that describes their similarities, their differences and their contributions to a common cycling ecosystem. A smart cycling approach should allow sensing systems from multiple bicycles to compete for the best way to address specific data collection goals and to complement each other to serve broader data needs. Rather than assuming uniformity, the model should explore heterogeneity as the best way to allow these sensing systems to serve the very diverse set of data needs associated with smart cycling. In this work, we aim to explore this path by providing a comprehensive analysis of the design space of bicycle sensing systems. Our research objectives can be summarized by these fundamental research questions. What is the range of sensors that should be integrated into sensing systems of bicycles to provide a comprehensive view of urban cycling activity and its context? 
And second, what are the key trade-offs involved in the design of sensing bicycles and how can they be optimized to reach a most effective result in the context of broader smart cycling ecosystems? To explore the possible answers to these questions, we have started developing our own prototype of a bicycle sensing system. Using this prototype uh, as a research contest, we have experimented different designs by creating multiple variants of sensing system. This provided a key learning context to understand the sensitivities associated with this sensing context and access the real value that can be obtained from various types of sensors. This experimental work was complemented with an analysis of the sensing design space of bicycles. This analysis was organized around three layers, more specifically the universe of viable sensors, the value propositions offered by those services through the service they enable, and the collective perspective of how to combine heterogeneous sensing systems to optimize their value to the whole ecosystem. This broader perspective should provide new insights for development of sensing systems for bicycles and the understanding of their role in the larger context of urban cycling services. Our own prototype of a sensing system for bicycles was an important research tool in this work. More than a goal itself, this bicycle allowed us to experiment many sensing alternatives and uncover multiple challenges associated with sensors on bicycles. The bicycle design is not attached to any particular form of sensing or any particular usage of the data collected. Instead, the system is designed to support a broad range of sensing possibilities and be instantiated in various ways, according to the requirements of specific research goals. Therefore, there is not a unique prototype specification, but rather a set of diverse prototype instances created throughout the project to study specific perspectives of sensing bicycles. These various instances may differ in different ways, such as their specific set of sensors, the way those sensors are physically deployed, uh, or the sp specifics of the data collection process. The structure exploration of these many possibilities provides us uh, a broader view of the whole range of uh, on-bike sensing possibilities and creates actionable knowledge on how to define specific sensing strategies for specific sensing goals. It also creates a context where it can be possible to compare multiple competing uh, alternatives for similar forms of sensing. To improve the generalization of the results, we also avoided any major assumptions about uh, the ways in which systems like this could be embedded into a common bicycle. Uh, for example, embedded directly on the bike or attached to uh, as a removal add-on. We'll, however, try to explicitly uh, identify any effects associated with sensor positions or with uh, other design decisions that may impact on the viability of particular, um, particular deployment approaches. Data collection is the ultimate goal of any sensing system and is therefore a critical part of this research on sensing bicycles. Our data collection process is structured around three complementary data collection processes as represented in the following figure. They are distinct processes because they serve uh, different goals but they also have many interdependencies and shared steps. Urban data collection is what we envision as a generic large-scale data generation process 
where a large number of different types of sensing bicycles are in operation to regularly produce the data needed to support various types of urban cycling services. This is the most generic process supported by the sensing bicycle and essentially corresponds to the normal execution of the software of the control board unit. The sensing bicycle can also be used to produce training data for machine learning models. In this case, data collection should be done under a more structured protocol to control the specific variables involved and facilitate the notation of relevant events. Videos can be used to support this annotation process. They show the concrete situations being experienced during the ride and they will normally include voice descriptions of the events made by the rider. Each study will conduct whatever specific data manipulation processes it may need to produce specific machine learning models. Those machine learning models may at some point integrate the normal data processing flow to support the automated identification of such events during the ride and share them as additional data stream produced by the bicycle. A central research question in our work is how to determine the set of sensors that should be available on bicycles to support their role as sensing entities. Our experimental work on sensing systems for bicycles may provide us with many insights about the implications of certain design decisions or about the use of concrete sensors, but it does not take us closer to the answer to this question. This is a very open-ended question, which would normally be easier to answer if made in the context of a concrete system with specific sensing goals. Trying to provide a generic answer can be much harder, as it requires the generic exploration of sensing possibilities, their viability in the context, cycling context, and also the potential value of the respective data for concrete application domains in the cycling ecosystem. The overall process can be, can be seen involving three successive layers of analysis, which pro progressively reduce the set of sensors to be considered, as represented in the following figure. The starting point in this analysis is the universe of, of bicycle sensing possibilities, which we define as the range of physical phenomena uh, that are measurable, meaningful in the cycling domain and viable. S sensor viability is determined by their cost and by the practical implication of their deployment on the bicycles, such as dependability, size, uh, volume, mass, and longevity. For the purpose of this study, we will assume a loose interpretation of viability and consider that the universe of sensing possibilities correspond to all the sensors previously suggested by this purpose in the other studies and market products. Given the wide range of sensing possibilities and their various applications domains, uh, we structure this analysis around a set of sensing profiles, which represent particular sensor types that share the same type of sensing phenomena and similar application domain. This profile structure explores the fact that the various sensors possibilities are not independent between each other. Similar sensors will typically be used for similar purposes and most of the time will just be alternative solutions to the same problem. By treating them as a whole, we significantly reduce the complexity of the analysis while still maintaining the capability to make meaningful connections between sensors and their value propositions. We will now present the proposed list of eight sensing profiles. Position Profile The position profile assumes the existence of position sensors that can determine the position of the bicycle. 
Precision data play a major role in the sensing process, not just a core data itself, but also a way to share reference data generated by other sensors. This profile may thus be often used in combination with other profiles. Position sensors rank high on viability as they can be low cost, discrete, and pose no major processing requirements, especially when no real time data is involved. Whenever there is the need to determine the position of the bicycle on a regular basis, a GPS receiver is the common solution. The motion profile. Motion measurements can provide key data to understand the smoothness of the ride. When properly analyzed by machine learning models, this data can produce high-level knowledge about the motion patterns of the ride, including the driving style or the identification of events such as braking, turning, road bumps, or irregular tracks. This type of data can serve many relevant purposes, including those related with safety. The motion profile is mainly composed by MEU sensors. These sensors can be low cost, however, they, need, they produce large volumes of data that needs to be processed locally or otherwise uh, transferred to a server. Environmental profile. The environmental sensors can measure a wide range of environmental characteristics, such as gas concentration, uh, particles in the air, uh, light intensity, humidity level, atmospheric pressure or temperature. In the cycling domain, this data can be useful to inform each cyclist about the level of exposure to hazard elements uh, experienced during the, uh, daily rides and complement information about root quality. For instance, the presence of uh, certain particles can be a predictor of heavy uh, motor traffic. This data can be very useful beyond cycling context, as bicycles are frequently recognized as the ideal vehicles for mobile environmental data collection. These sensors do not place many new additional requirements, but some of them uh, can be particularly expensive as required specific installation settings or calibration procedures that may not be compatible with large scale uh, crowdsourcing and data collection. The surrounding space. The surrounding uh, profile in includes distance sensors to provide the perspective of the route quality and safety. Distance between the bicycle and nearby objects defines the free surrounding space with which can be important indicator uh, for the safety risks associated sh short distances to other vehicles or potential obstacles. Common distance sensors possibly pointing into different directions, may provide simple data about the nearest objects. A more sophisticated perception of the surrounding space can be created with data obtained from LiDAR or radar devices, as they offer the additional capability to make 3D representations and identify, identify uh, object sizes. However, LiDAR and radar sensors can be much more demanding in regard to their deployment on bicycle and their data processing requirements. The rider profile. The rider is the, the center of the cycling experience and therefore data from the rider can also provide key insights about the experience. The heartbeat rate is commonly used in sports context, but it may also be uh, used as a proxy for the level of stress experienced during the ride. A cadence sensor can measure the rotations per minute uh, performed by the rider uh, on the pedal and therefore the effort the, the cyclist is making. The, the, the video profile. Uh, with the proper processing capability, video can be a powerful form of sensing. But automated collection of data uh, from computer vision processes is not common on bicycles, mainly due to strong processing requirements. For the purpose of this study, we will embrace video mainly as a source of run-through data through the creation of autonomous video streams for later uh, annotation of relevant uh, events. In this context, 
we can expect video profile to be used mainly in the context of professional data collection activities. The sound profile. This, the, this, the, while potentially a form of environmental sensing sound, sound can be used to support more advanced interpretations of the cycling context. The level of sound obtained from a simple sound level uh, sensor may be used as a proxy for traffic levels. Sound data obtained with microphone may enable machine learning methods that explore particular sound frequencies associated with riding events. For instance, different types of surface will typically uh, produce distinct combinations of sound frequencies and being overtaken by a car may also produce a unique sound signature. The proximity uh, profile, proximity sensors, enable uh, bicycles to detect the presence of nearby entities without any physical contact. This is not concerned with the physical proximity to surrounding objects, as is the case with distance sensors. This is about logical proximity to rec recognizable entities such as other bicycles, cars, bike counters uh, that are able to identif identify themselves and possibly engage in more sophisticated communications, like Bluetooth, uh, RFID, are commonly used for this purpose. These eight profiles do not correspond to a specific bicycle instances. They are meant to be combined in many different ways. In particular, the position profile can be expected to be often included when one of the other profiles is also included. By describing sensing systems from the perspective of the supported sensing profiles, it becomes possible to have a common framework to discuss many different sensing bicycle designs. The universe of cycling sensors can be very large, but any realistic cycling sensing setup will have to be shaped by the worthiness of that they produced. Worthiness is essentially determined by the demand size and the concrete value propositions that can be associated with the data produced by those sensors. To scope this analysis, we'll focus on cycling routes as the core data entity in our model. Our problem can thus be defined as identifying the types of data that are the most relevant to characterize cycling mobility on a given route network. We mainly consider two major types of data, trips that define movement, for instance, where bicycles are passing and at what speed, and route annotations that characterize routes, for instance, what type of road surface is there or what types of riding events are generated. These two dimensions can be combined with the individual and collective perspectives. For example, combining trips with the collective perspective corresponds to the road traffic measurements, for instance, volume metrics. From an individual perspective, trip information can be used to track individual process and achievements. The combination of these dimensions and their key results are depicted in the following figure. The research literature includes a vast body of research on route selection criteria, which we have used to match sensing possibilities to worthy data applications. In particular, we have considered that the service along the various layers of the bicycle pyramid uh, model proposed by the BITS project. The five proposed layers from bottom to top include safety and reliability, speed, convenience, comfort, and experience. This is an extensive and prioritized view of multiple elements that can shape cycling activities and ultimately determine its adoption, and therefore provide a good framework for matching data with value it can generate. Once again, we'll use the abstractions offered by the sensing profiles to facilitate the association between any specific sensing bicycle designs and concrete urban cycling services. The result is summarized in the following table 
which describe the mapping between different sensing profiles and particular sets of services. By providing a perspective of the mapping between sensing systems and the key data-centric services, this table should help developers to consider which profiles to include to obtain specific services, or given a set of profiles to understand what can realistically be achieved with the available data. The final layer in the analysis is to move beyond the individual bicycle and consider how to optimize the entire cycling sensing ecosystem. Ideally, once you define the target services and then identify the sensor profile that need to be included to support those services, we would like to have all the bicycles equipped with all sensors for all those profiles. In reality, this assumption is challenged by a multiple effects, which occur across the various parts of the system and are common to any sensing bicycle design. These effects represent a design trade-off between the quantity and the quality of the data that needs to be collected and the costs are assholes involved in the data collection process, as represented in the conceptual map in the presented figure. The key design decision regards to sensing profiles to deploy on each bike. In our work with the prototype bicycle, we found from our many integration attempts that the number of end range of sensors deployed on a particular bicycle seems to have a major impact across a number of other key design goals, particularly cost, convenience and heterogeneity. These first two costs and convenience will significantly impact the number of bicycles that can expect to be involved in the sensing system. The impact of cost is self-explanatory. The impact of sensor diversity is mainly associated with the potential strong increase in the system complexity. There will be more complex integration issues and especially there will be more and more specific deployment requirements leading to all sorts of hindrances such as specific pre-ride operations, additional cables on the bicycle, special configurations, regular maintenance or sensor sensors placed at inconvenient positions in the bicycle. This will impact ne negatively on the cycling experience and would probably be enough to drive cyclists away from any form of sensing. While previous work has often assumed sensing bicycles as part of a uniform fleet equipped with a specific set of sensors, this analysis led us to the opposite conclusion. Future smart cycling ecosystems are much more likely to be composed by a very heterogeneous uh, set of bicycles with various combinations, uh, combinations of sensing profiles. This will be even more the case whenever the, we consider that the broad range of services and consequently a broad range of sensing profiles should be available. This is also much more aligned with, the, with an ecosystem view, which naturally assumes the existence of many stakeholders with very different needs and consequently with different priorities uh, on what sensors to include in their bicycles. Ultimately, each individual cyclist will also be making his or her own decision on what sensing add-ons to use when cycling. Sensors and bicycles are a powerful combination that is attracting significant attention from research and the industry perspectives. While many technical approaches have already been explored, there is a, a gap on how to approach this topic from an ecosystem perspective where many stakeholders can be involved and data is being collected by very diverse sensing bicycles, all of which uh, with their own technology and sensing concepts. The novelty of this contribution is the broader and more generic perspective of this study, which aimed to pursue a more explicit and thorough analysis of the various dimensions shaping the key trade-offs for cycling sensing systems. 
This is an, an ongoing work where are, we are planning to develop further research to provide more throughout indications on how to design, describe and combine very diverse sets of sensing bicycles. In particular, he planned to, to explore the quantification of the size and relative proportion of the samples needed to offer the services associated with each pro sensing profile. This knowledge is crucial to support the planning of smart fleets of heterogeneous bicycles where the combination of various profiles is optimized according to the target services. We also plan to evolve the definition of reference design for sensitive bicycles. This should offer a common reference for the describing the sensing affordances of a particular bicycle design, from the simplest ones to a full-fledged uh, pro bicycle for professional data collection. This should allow those sensing possibilities to be combined in many different ways, while allowing their results to be analyzed consistently. With this model, it, it should become possible to relate multiple sensing bicycle designs as variants of the, a common model, and it should be easier to integrate data generated from different instances in shared data sets. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please just ask, or if you don't have the opportunity, you can send an email to this address. Thank you. Welcome to my presentation, how to calibrate low-cost sensors with elastic weight consolidation algorithm. Neural networks are successfully used to solve complex ta tasks in data-intensive areas such as statistics, economics, computer science and others. They are an integral part of applications in artificial intelligence. But they are still far from being able to reproduce all the capabilities of a human brain. One of them is transfer learning. For example, if I have learned to operate a computer game with a gamepad, I don't have to learn how to operate the gamepad for another game, but only how to use it in the changed game environment. In 2017, James Kirkpatrick introduced a transfer learning algorithm called Elastic Weight Consolidation which enables neural networks to learn how to operate different Atari games one after the other. During the learning phase, they can use the similarities in the operation of the games to learn other games easier and faster. But what do Atari games have in common with low-cost fine-dust sensors? Low-cost sensors have a big disadvantage compared to the high-quality ones. A measurement inaccuracy which is so large that none of the sensors can be used without extensive calibration. But the calibration of sensors is like the learning of Atari games a transfer task. Why this? A neural network which should learn to calibrate different sensors has to learn how to react to different environmental conditions like humidity, temperatures and others and it should learn to compensate the manufacturing tolerances of the sensors. But the model that has to be learned to react to the environmental factors is the same for all sensors. So this should be the part that can be transferred. But why should transfer learning be used at all? One could simply train the nets for each sensor and you. The answer is time and data. To train a network for a sensor, it must be fed with sufficient amounts of data for weeks or even months at a reference station. So our task was to show whether neural networks can be calibrated much faster and with less data using elastic weight consolidation. Transfer learning is a typical skill of learning in biological systems. It describes the ability to transfer a learned problem solution to another comparable situation. In particular, this means 
that knowledge acquired through learning about concrete objects or contexts can be applied to similar use cases by generalizing or abstracting. This ability is tried to be reproduced by the elastic weight algorithm. Low-cost sensors are very cheap, easy to use in large quantities and can be easily carried around because of their low weight. But they are characterized by high measurement inaccuracies due to systematic errors, the use of components with high production tolerance and sensitivity to environmental influences. As a result, simple regression methods soon reach their limits and neural networks can be used for calibration. This is because learning complex nonlinear models is an area in which neural networks excel. Urban air quality has become one of the most important problems of our time. The air we breathe is directly related to the quality of people's lives. Particulate matter pollution is one of the largest risks to health worldwide and also contributes to environmental problems such as acid rain, ozone layer depletion and global climate change. In industrialized countries, there is on average one official measuring station per 100,000 inhabitants in cities, whereas in developing countries with high levels of air pollution, there is one measuring station per a million inhabitants. Traditionally, these expensive high-quality devices are operated by government institutions. Particulate matter is divided into two size classes, particles up to 2.5 micrometers and up to 10, 10 micrometers in size. Both size classes have different levels of respirable capacity and thus different levels of health risk. Classic measurement grids are unsuitable to capture high spatial and temporal dynamics of air pollution in the urban atmosphere. But with the usage of big amounts of low-cost sensors, one could build a close meshed net able to fulfill this task as soon as these sensors could be calibrated to deliver not exact but reliable data. The Smart Air Quality Network project, sponsored by the German government, pursues a pr pragmatic data-driven approach that for the first time combines existing data sets with a networked mobile measurement strategy. The main goal of this project is to develop a complete data acquisition system that will be used to visualize and predict the spatial distribution of air pollutants with a relevant impact on the quality of life of citizens in cities. Existing data sources will be complemented by a network of mobile and stationary low-cost sensors. The Smart AccuNet project aims to realize an intelligent, reproducible, spatially and temporarily high-resolution and yet cost-effective air quality measurement system. What do we want to investigate in our work? In the first step, we want to show that our networks are in principle capable of calibrating sensors. In the second step, the nets will be trained once with and once without elastic weight consolidation on a set of new unknown sensors. It will be investigated whether the nets trained with the new algorithm can be trained faster and with less data. If it turns out that the sensors can actually be calibrated with less data and thus much faster, the first step is, step is done to enable smart AccuNet participants to calibrate their sensors on their own and to recalibrate them regularly over the lifetime of the network. The elastic weight consolidation algorithm considers neural networks from a probability theoretical point of view. Thereby, a training is the set search for weights that best describe a given data set. The conditional probability p theta d describes the distribution of the weights theta for the given data. The mean value of this distribution is the loss function which has to be minimized. For two sensors, the amount of data is determined by the measurements of sensor A and sensor B. The conditional probability p theta d a cannot be calculated directly and is therefore approximated by a Laplace approximation. If one considers the space of weights described by a neural network from a geometrical point of view, weight vectors that are well suited for the task of a neural network should be closed together. This information, theoretical distance, can be calculated in a certain local environment 
around a weight vector using the Fisher matrix. The calculation of this distance with the Fisher matrix is the key for the elastic weight consolidation algorithm to enable neural networks to transfer learning. So, since the Fisher matrix can be used to calculate informal distances, it is used as a square penalty in the loss function during the train training of the second sensor. So, the further the weight vectors in training move away from the weight vector calculated in the first training, which means nothing else than that the new weight vectors are not as well suited to describe the data set of the first sensor as others, the greater the penalty. The result of this procedure is that the weight vectors found in the second training are well suited to describe both the data of the first sensor and the data of the second sensor. This imitates the procedure that is probably used in biological systems to anchor what has been learned. There, synapses are consolidated on nerves that were formed during the learning phase. These nerves then exhibit less plasticity, remain stable and thus unalterable over a longer period of time. We have derived the structure and type of our neural networks from the structure of other networks that are usually used for regression tasks. According to the universal approximation theorem, theoretically a hidden layer with a finite number of neurons is sufficient to approximate any continuous function. Practically, there is currently no way to find such nets and adjust the hyperparameters accordingly. Therefore, for most problems, we need a certain depth and redundancy for our learning algorithms to work. Small test runs have shown that nets with three layers give good results. Since there is no exact knowledge about which environmental parameters influence the sensors except humidity and temperature, we decided to use all measurement measured parameters of the reference station. Which of them might be obsolete has to be clarified in future experiments. The hyperparameters used in our experiments for the optimization of the networks correspond to the usual ones used in this field. The test procedure was as follows. In the first step, we used Bayesian optimization to perform an initial search for suitable parameter combinations for the hyperparameters. Bayesian optimization is an effective method for the glo global optimization of functions with expensive evaluations. We then used these found combinations in the following steps. In the pre-selection, we made a rough estimate of the amount of data needed for a training and further reduced the number of nets used for the final trainings. In the final training, the nets were trained first for the initial sensor and then for the sensors for transfer learning once with and once without elastic waste consolidation and the results were compared to each other. Bayesian optimization showed that there is a wide range of suitable parameter combinations. Here is a small selection of parameter combinations that show a small loss in the marked column and thus a good result. The batch size is the number of records that are passed through the net before the weights are updated on the net. Here a tendency towards rather, rather larger batches can be seen. The number of neurons per layer showed no clear tendency. In the activation functions only the sigmoid function did not show good results. The learning rate of neural networks is a control parameter of some training algorithms which controls the step size during the iterative adaption of weights. Again, no clear tendency has been shown. With the optimization algorithms, only the RMS prop optimizer did not give good results. In the Bayesian optimization, 252 nets were selected, which were trained in the pre-selection with a larger number of epochs and more repetitions on differently sized training data sets. In the pre-selection, it was shown that for both particle sizes, normalized data give better, better results. Therefore, we used only normalized data in the final test series. Based on the relationship between the mean squared error for training data, the mean squared error for test data and the absolute values of the mean squared error for test data, we have made an estimate of the minimum amount of data required to successfully train the network. The large difference between the results for the training runs seen on the left side of the curves and the test runs indicate a strong overtraining with two small data, data sets. 
The point of intersection of the two curves gives an indication of the minimum amount of data to be used for a training, which corresponds approximately to the measurements taken within 38 hours. Since we trained all sensor combinations with the selected nets from the pre-selection in 10 runs each, we had about 2,400 trained nets for our evaluation at the end. On the right side of the ovals marked with initial training and follow-up training, which is the transfer learning step, you may see the training steps and on the left side the evaluation steps. The datasets from the initial sensors are marked blue. The datasets of the sensor for transfer learning are marked orange. In the first step, the networks were trained on the data of the initial sensors and evaluated then on the data of the initial sensors and the data of the transfer learning sensors to determine how well the nets initially evaluate on this data. In the second step, the nets were trained on the data of the sensors for transfer learning once with AVC algorithm and once without. The evaluation was done on both datasets, the data of the initial sensors and on the data of the sensors for transfer learning. All training test and evaluation datasets used for the different trainings are disjunctive. The first two columns on this slide show the comparison how the nets trained on the data of the initial sensors evaluate on this data shown uh, in the columns marked turquoise and green and on the data of the sensors for transfer learning the column marked turquoise and red. It is clear to see that they evaluate much worse on the data of the sensors for transfer learning regardless of the amount of data and the number of epochs used. This expected re result shows that in the trained nets the individual differences of the sensors are included and thus explain the different quality of the evaluations. Since the results for the size class 2.5 microns do not differ significantly from the, sen from the, from the ones with 10 microns, we present only the results for the size class 10 microns. Columns 3 to 5 show the evaluation results after the nets have been trained in the second step on the data of the sensors for transfer learning, once with and once without elastic weight consolidation. The blue-orange column shows the evaluation results for the training with elastic weight consolidation on the data of the initial sensors. It can be seen that they still evaluate well on this data, although not as well as after the initial training. The comparison between the last two columns shows that the nets trained without elastic weight consolidation, marked in blue and yellow, evaluate approximately as well on the transfer learning data as those trained with elastic weight consolidation as expected. Also as expected, nets trained without elastic weight consolidation evaluate much worse on the initial data set. Um, also these results are not shown on this slide. But what can be seen very well in the last column is that the NETS trains with EVC need a much smaller amount of data for the training to show good evaluation results than those without. To be seen in the comparison of the rows marked with the data set EVC fraction 5 and 80. This can be explained by transfer learning, which uses the information already learned from the initial training. The comparison of the datasets shows that data from a measurement period of 6 hours marked with EVC fraction 5 are almost sufficient to achieve a sufficient evaluation quality. Furthermore, the mark column shows that the number of epochs seems to have only a small influence on the quality of the nets. To verify the test results, Significance tests were carried out, which clearly show that the differences in the evaluation quality of the networks trained with and without EVC are clearly, clearly significant. In summary, it can be said that Bayesian optimization has proven to be a well-suited tool to find suitable parameter combinations for the construction of neural networks if there is a little prior no knowledge about their expected behavior. It has been shown that for this application area, normalizing the data shows better results. Above all, it has been shown that using the EVC algorithm, 
The models learned in an in initial training can be used to train the nets much faster. The amount of data is significantly reduced from the measurements collected in 32 hours for the initial training to the, to the amount co uh, collected in 6 hours. Since our investigation was very coarse-meshed regarding the structure of the neural networks and the selection of the network parameters, further improvements can be made in this area. Among other things, the, the amount of data actually required should be examined more closely and thus also how long the sensor must initially be calibrated at the reference station. Furthermore, a detailed investigation should take place which parameters actually influence the measurement results of the sensors. If on this basis, citizen networks should be used for the construction of closed meshed air quality measurements, there are still many open questions. Up to which distance from the reference stations the measurement re results can still be corrected in sufficient quality? Is an on-the-fly calibration possible? Can calibration data be exchanged between different sensors? How can the networks be adapted to different reference stations? Can transfer learning also be used here? How often the nets have to be retrained and much more. But a good start is done with these results. Many thanks. Hello, this is Yoshio Nagata, a bachelor student from Nagoya University in Japan. I would like to present about person flow estimation with preserving privacy using multiple 3D people counters. This is the overview of my presentation. Firstly, I would like to explain the significance of person flow and introduce some person flow estimation techniques. After that, I will explain our proposed person flow estimation method using multiple 3D people counters. Next, I will show you the experimental result in the international airport and discuss about that. Finally, I will summarize our contribution and present about future work. Then let me introduce the importance of person flow. Person flow is a flow so people created from some data source including smartphones, packet sensors, cameras, and so on. In recently, person flow data is collected for various purposes as shown in the slide. For example, shopping mall owners install sensors in their shops and analyze how long people stay in a specific place and which corridors are frequently visited. The analysis data are useful to consider how to change an arrangement of shops or goods to improve their sales. On the other hand, collecting person flow in public spaces such as station or park is also useful to avoid congestion. Especially in 2020, these needs are rising due to COVID-19 because using person flow, we can see how many people in the area and event owners can limit the number of people in it. I will show you some person flow acquisition or estimation method in this and the next slides. The GPS is the most well-known location acquisition system and this can be used to acquire your person flow. In most cases, the location data is collected from an application in a person's smartphone. Thanks to the accuracy of GPS, this method can correct the most accurate person flow. However, Continuously collecting location data by GPS result in a big electricity consumption for mobile devices. Also, users' location data from GPS is very difficult to collect in many cases such as shopping malls and stations. On the other hand, mobile network operators can retrieve person flow from their customers' behavior. This method seems to be low cost because no additional facility or electricity consumption for customers' devices are needed, but needs proper anonymization for acquired data. Furthermore, these data are only available for mobile network operators, so we generally cannot use this technique. Besides, smartphones send probe request packets via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and we can estimate personal flow by collecting them in some places. 
This method also have no additional battery impact on user's device, but more and more users are not be able to track because recent smartphones OS randomizes a MAC address of each device. The final is a powerful camera. So far, various types of cameras including single lens, thermal, IR, 3D have been used to capture people movement. The advantages of camera method is that collected data does not rely on user's device, so we can count all people equally. Also, this method is better for protecting privacy if sensors do not save pictures. However, covering a large area with a matrix of camera sensors is likely to be more expensive than other methods. So in our study, we developed privacy-preserving personal flow estimation method which uses 3D people counter. This method protects privacy by saving only persons passing data without saving the acquired image. In our experiment, we use VC3D sensor from Vitalcon. Also, we are aim to cover larger areas than other methods using camera. As we see, only using a single camera can cover a small area, but installing matrix of camera in a large area is very expensive. So we install camera sensors at every gate of the target area and estimate person flow from correlation of sensor data. This is the detail of the VC3D people counter from Vitrogon, which we use in our experiment. This sensor has a stereo camera and an image processing unit. This sensor can be installed on the ceiling of the room and the sensor's camera looks down at the gate from the ceiling. The sensor's camera can monitor the area up to the length of 10 meters and 7 meters and can be installed at the height of between 2.4 meters and 6 meters. Also, the sensor's image processing system can recognize the person from capture images and output the person passing data including time, direction, person's height, and passing duration. In addition, we know the length of monitoring area from sensor settings, so we can calculate the working speed from passing duration. Using the correlation of these sensor data, we estimate person flow. This is a brief explanation of person flow estimation. In the left movie, we saw a green point when a sensor detects some entering people and a red point when a sensor detects some leaving people. We can count the number of people in the area from left movie, but we cannot track each person's movement. On the other hand, in the right movie, each blue point shows the individual person's movement in the area. We created this movie from estimated person flow data. Let me introduce the procedure of person flow estimation by our proposed method. First of all, we collect the sensor data from multiple sensors and store it to our database. Next, we retrieve the data and calibrate it to eliminate errors. After that, we estimate people in our data from the correlation of calibrated sensor data. The in data consists of the in time and gate of persons entering and leaving. Also, we interpret the estimated in data to get collision-free person flow data and visualize the interpreted person flow data. Therefore, the person flow data consists of the timeline of the person's location in the area. Again, using our proposed method, we create person flow data shown in the right movie from the sensor data shown in the left movie. So let's start with calibration of sensor data. In general, sensors installed in the same area are expected to have similar height average and walking speed average values in the long span. However, the actual data have a big error between sensors. This error seems to be derived from individual differences in the sensors and installation environment and it can lead to estimation mess. So we install this calibration of sensor data in estimation procedure. In our experiment, we shift all sensors height data so that the average is the same value, 160 cm, 
and arrange them so that the variance is the same, 15, which is a common value in most sensor data. After calibration, we estimate in-out data from sensor data. Before explaining the estimation method, let me explain the prerequisites of the following explanation. In following explanation, we assume the estimation target area, which has three gates, and all gates have a sensor. Therefore, all people who enter and leave the area are counted by the sensor ideally. Also, I will explain four estimation methods mainly, and this method uses different set of data individually. The method A uses passing time and direction, and it is the simplest method. The method B also uses person height, and the method C also uses walking speed. Finally, the method D uses all sensor data and two variety of strategy, and strategy, and all strategy. So let's start with method A. This method uses passing time and direction, and the left bar graph is the sample data of three sensors. The color of bar represents the passing direction, and the height of the bar shows how many people pass in the time period, correspond to horizontal axis. Therefore, the sensor 1 counts 10 people around 10.15, and the sensor 2 counts 4 people 30 seconds after sensor 1, and the sensor 3 counts 6 people 45 seconds after sensor 1. In this station, there are no other gates in the area and no passing detail. We can estimate that 4 people move from gate 1 to 2 over about 30 seconds and 6 people move from gate 1 to 3 over about 45 seconds. Similarly, finding these patterns of sensor data, we can estimate enough data. Next is a method B, which uses passing time, direction, and person's height. The main concept of this method is that the pair of entering and leaving sensor data which have similar height seem to be one person entering and leaving data. For example, the orange person is the shortest among the four people, so his leaving data counted by orange sensor is connected to entering data which has the shortest height at green sensor. Collecting this pair of data, we can estimate individual persons in and out data. In the following presentation, I will explain the detail of finding pairs of entering and leaving data. Determine the same person's data, we first recalculate the score between all patterns of pairs of entering data and leaving data. The score consists of three factors and calculated by multiplying them. I will explain the summary of the three parameters and explain in detail later. The first factor is TIG, the similarity between an ideal duration and a duration calculated from entering data and leaving data. This parameter is used to exclude pairs whose calculated duration is too short or too long for one person's moving data. To calculate this parameter, we use predefined duration thresholds for all sensor pairs. The second is HIG, the similarity of person height between entering data and leaving data. This is a key parameter for this method and calculated by the difference between person's height of two data and the predefined thresholds. The final parameter is FRPQ, the reality of P person flow between sensors and entering and leaving data. This parameter is used to eliminate the person flow which can hardly occur considering the environment of an area. Let me explain about the detail of TIG and HIG. Each TIG and HIG is calculated by square error from base value and threshold. For TIG, the base value is predefined average moving duration between sensors, and the threshold is also predefined minimum and maximum moving duration between sensors. We define these duration by the distances between sensors and the human's average walking speed, about 4 km hour. Next, for HIG, the base value is the height of entering data, HPI, and the threshold is the predefined value, HE. The value of HE is defined by the reliability of the sensor data, 
So the more the high the data from the sensor data seems to be accurate, the smaller value we can set for HE and we can get better estimation result. Using these base values and thresholds, we calculate the square area to get TIG and HIG, and the right figure shows the relative value of the multiplication of TIG and HIG from PI. Next is our flow reality matrix called FRMA. FRMA defines how likely personal flow is to occur between each sensor. FRAB is the element of FRMA and represents the reality of occurrences of personal flow from the gates of sensor A to B. This value ranges from 0 to 1, and the higher FRAB is, the more likely to occur personal flow from sensor A to B. FRM is defined from the environment of the area in advance. For example, in public spaces such as station, most people move from one gate to another gate. Therefore, we should set smaller value for FRAA, same gate. Also, the gates which have same distinction should also be set to a small value. The merit of introducing FRM is that we can animate estimation mess by applying the environment condition of the area. Using three factors, we calculate the score by multiplying them for all entering and leaving data pairs. After that, we retrieve the pair from which is earlier entering time and has higher score than others. And we consider these pairs as enough data. This is a sample case for method P. In the left figure shows the sample sensor data. In this figure, the intensity of the background color shows the score from point B, so the entering data point B is connected to leaving data point C because point C has a higher score for point B. Similarly applying the same procedure for all other entering and leaving points, the estimation result is as shown in the right figure. We can retrieve in-out data from this figure. However, point D and E are not connected to any data. This is either because of sensor error or because there was no corresponding data within the time frame of this sample data. The next is method C, which uses passing time, direction, and person's walking speed. However, main concept of this method is the same as method P, only difference in that method C uses person's walking speed instead of height. In other words, the similarity of walking speed, VIG, is calculated in the same way as the similarity of height, HIG. Also, we calculate the score as shown in the slide. The last is method D, which uses all sensor data. This method includes two strategies of score calculation, which uses different combination of methods B and C. The first is AND strategy, which multiplies all factors I introduced in this presentation. So this strategy imposes most strict conditions for sensor data, but seems to be able to estimate most accurate in out data. The second is OR strategy, which uses method P and C. In this strategy, method P's score calculation is used at first and estimate in out data. After that, with the remaining sensor data, method C is used. This strategy is useful when we want to retrieve as much in out data as possible. The final step of personal flow estimation is the interpolation of in out data. Simply visualizing in out data, that is, Visualizing linear movement between entering and leaving can lead to walls of scores and people colliding with each other. In other words, simple visualization of in out data lacks of reality. Therefore, we introduce RVO2 to realize more realistic visualization. RVO2 has the collision avoidance algorithm called Optimal Reciprocal Collision Avoidance, or CA so we can obtain collision-free personal flow. Additionally, we customize RVO2 for personal flow visualization. 
in the data with the timeline of persons entering and leaving data, so we have to add or remove person in the alveol to simulation. Therefore, we created this feature and use it for interpolation. After interpolation, we visualize the person flow data using Hamwell views. Hamwell views is a special temporal visualization library using DeckGL. So we created the visualization data which can be imported by the hardware base from estimated person flow and visualize it. In our experiment, we install sensors at Access Plaza in Chubu Central International Airport, IT Japan. Access Plaza is connected to many airport facilities including airport terminal, train station, hotel, bus stops, and parking. I will show the experiment result of the sensor data collected from Access Plus. So this is the result by method A. Apparently, we can see majority of people seem to move from sensor group 7 to sensor group 1, as shown in the red rectangles. So we can see how many people moved from group 7 to 1 approximately. However, other groups had few data and its origin or destination are hardly determined from this data. Therefore, we can use method A in the situation where a large number of people enter the same gate and leave the same gate at once, but it is difficult to track individual person's move. Here is the estimation result using method B. In contrast to the result of method A, there are estimated in out connection in the time period when few sensor data were observed. There are also estimated in out connection between not only the sensor groups which have much passing data, group 1 and 7, but also the sensor groups which have few passing data, group 2 to 6. As some of them are indicated by yellow arrows. In this method, the estimation rate from sensor data to in out data is about 79%. This is the result by method C. Unfortunately, the working speed data calculated from sensor data has big variance, ranges from 0 to 10 meters per second. Therefore, we can obtain few data the method P and the reliability of the estimation results seem to be also less reliable than method P. This is the estimation result by method D1 and strategy. In this figure, the radius of data points represents walking speed and some of the sensor data which has too big walking speed to be connected to other data are eliminated in order to keep the readability of the result. As a result, we obtained in out data from 30% of the sensor data. Similarly to method C, this low estimation rate is considered to be due to walking speed error. And this is the estimation result by method D2, or strategy. In this method, we obtain about 3% higher estimation rate than method B. In other words, 3% of the sensor data were converted to in out data by method C, and these in out data are shown as blue line in this figure. However, this data has a big height difference between entering and leaving, so the reliability of this data is seem to be low. We also examine the effectiveness of the FRM. This data shows the estimation result before introducing FRM. This data is the result after introducing FRM. To compare the result, I will show you the previous slide and go back to this slide. The estimation result in the right blue dashed circles will change, so please take a closer look inside them. This is the estimation result before introducing FRM. In this data, there are some in out data whose entering and leaving gate is the same. In the right blue dash circle, the in out data indicated by yellow arrow shows that a person entered from gate 7 and left from gate 7. However, after introducing FRM, some of these in out data are disappear and some of the sensor data created or changed appear. 
in the light blue dash circle, the in-out data in previous slide disappeared and the new in-out data indicated by yellow arrow emerged. Therefore, FRM seems to be able to correct some of the unnatural in-out data. And this is a final experiment about interpolation and visualization. The left video shows a simple visualization of in-out data, and the right shows the interpolated person flow data. As you can see, the people in left video collide with force and other people, but the people in right does not collide with each other. So we can see more realistic visualization using interpolation by RVO2. This is the conclusion. Our contribution is that we proposed a method of personal flow estimation using multiple 3D people counters. And using method B, which uses person's height data, we could convert about 79% of the sensor data into person in out data. Also, FRM can reduce the wrong in out data to some extent. And finally, we introduce, customize the RVO2 library for interpolation and visualize the person flow by Hamelis. However, there are some issues to solve. The low accuracy of working speed data makes us hardly possible to estimate person flow accurately. Also, we should examine the validity of the person flow estimation result by collecting ground truth person flow data and collecting sensor data in more crowded situation. Finally, we should apply this method in more complicated places that have multiple areas because most places in our life, such as shopping mall, office, school, have often multiple areas. We are creating the estimation system for such places, and I will show you the beta version of this. This is a video of the in-out estimation result in multiple area. The right blue rectangle is the access browser, and you can also see the personal flow in another area. We have designed this system to work in multiple areas at the same time, with a delay of a few minutes after receiving real-time sensor data. I hope I can tell you the update about this system soon. That's about it. Thank you for listening. Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Miroslav Budeš from City in Prague and with our colleagues we have prepared a paper dedicated to some consolidated view on quality and reliability metrics for IoT systems because these metrics has been recently published in various papers for software systems but some consolidated view for IoT systems specifically has been missing. Let's start with the motivation. Why do we need some quality and reliability metrics? They are helpful in several stages of system development process, actually. They can measure the quality of created system under test during the creation phase, so we can react on suboptimalities in the system quality during its development. Then, when the system is already running in some production run, we can evaluate its reliability or security as well. Then we can optimize the effectiveness of testing and debugging process, collecting some metrics. And as well, these metrics which are used in this stage are usually applicable as well for exit criteria, which tells us when we are able to finish one testing phase and switch to another testing phase. And as well, using these metrics, we can define the acceptance criteria, which tells us when the product is ready to be placed to the production and the project can start its production run. 
Sometimes the quality metrics are confused with quality characteristics and those two concepts are slightly different, so let's explain them. Quality characteristic is usually considered as a general property of some system under test, which can be used in test planning, test strategy or test reporting. And usually it's not expressed by some formula that, that allows quantification of the measured property by some concrete number. Instead, those are just general categories like modularity, reusability, analyzability, modifiability, and so on. In contrast, quality metrics we are going to talk about today are usually expressed by some particular formula and provide detailed information expressed by some number. And the elements of this formula are typically quantifications of some elements of system under test, for instance, lines of code in case of line coverage, or some quantified information from the testing and test management process, like, for instance, a number of open defects or number of test cases which have been executed so far during the testing process. Speaking of standard software systems, so far the quality characteristics as well as quality metrics are covered by a number of publications and standards as well. For instance, speaking about quality characteristics here, this ISO standard split the system product quality to several main categories, starting from functional suitability to portability. And in each of these main categories, there is so there are several uh, quality characteristics defined. Then team up next takes similar approach. There is a number of quality characteristics for software defined in this uh, in this testing methodology, and as well ISTQB test certification standard touch this topic. And as well, TeamUp next recently defined uh, some quality characteristics as well for upcoming IoT systems, which is a great job they did. Credit, uh, credit for this. And speaking about uh, quality metrics with some particular formulas, which allows us for quantification of, uh, of the measured properties of some system under test, there is as well a lot of publications to various aspects like object-oriented design, maintainability, and uh, some papers which are providing some uh, comprehensive view. But maybe this comprehensive view is kind of missing for the IoT systems here. And the logical question here is, do the IoT systems really differ from the standard software systems? Definitely, yeah, the IoT systems are different, but from the testing viewpoint, actually there are the differences which might lead us to a revision of these quality and reliability metrics which can be helpful in developing the IoT systems. For instance, there is a larger heterogeneity of use technologies, protocols and devices usually in the IoT systems, which results in a high number of possible combinations of a system under test. So uh, maybe we need to take a slightly different approach, how to measure the quality arising from this variety, let's say. And as well, there are higher demands on interoperability and flawless integration of this, uh, these systems. And as well, currently there, there is a lower level of standardization of communication protocols in, in these systems compared to the software. So uh, this is something which as well impacts quality. And not speaking about various privacy and security issues which are currently reporting in this new IoT solutions. So all these reasons might lead us to revise the field a bit and provide some comprehensive view about how to measure the quality of the IoT systems. Obviously, there has been some individual attempts to define some metrics for IoT systems, and it would be surprising if not. We did the survey to uh, provide some comprehensive, uh, consolidated view of these uh, metrics which are available, and we found several categories. For instance, there are some quality models for evaluation of IoT applications and services published. As well, field which is well covered is measurement of quality of service for IoT systems. 
and also some work discussing the quality of end devices has been published. More references and more examples are given in the related work in the paper. But we actually haven't found uh, some consolidated view which can be applicable. Some revision paper uh, is available for quality of service approaches, some systematic mapping study. But we haven't found some consolidated study which would uh, put all these metrics in one place, do some discussion, some categorization uh, above them and provide the researchers and practitioners some unified views. So we took this attempt in this paper we are talking about. And the consolidated view we are presenting in the paper is split to three main categories and containing 25 metrics in total. The main categories we are discussing there is quality and reliability of IoT system, then performance of testing and debugging process. And logically, some metrics can be applied in these both categories right there. So we name them overlapping metrics. Just few of these metrics are our own suggestions. Mainly the overview is composed from the, from the metrics suggested in uh, various sources, which are cited in the paper. We did this literature review using uh, the established libraries like IEEE Explorer, ACM Digital Library, Springer, Elsevier, Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar, speaking about these aggregating indexes. And we are not really 100% sure that we have covered everything, but we have covered considerable amount of the literature in this in this overview. So this consolidated view could be quite complete considering this high level view. But you are never sure. Obviously, you can suggest more more metrics here. In the provided overview, we have taken just general viewpoint on the effectiveness of the testing process as well as on quality and reliability of uh, the system under test. And hence, we excluded some specific types of metrics here. Typically, the metrics related to quality of service on the network level, then variety of uh, test coverage metrics, because it's quite extensive area and each of these metrics relates to particular testing techniques. And uh, there is a lot of these testing techniques, so it's going to be quite a quite extensive, uh, extensive field. And moreover, these uh, testing techniques and metrics has been published in, in a number of publications so far. And as well, we have excluded specific source code quality metrics like cyclomatic complexity or cohesion and all this variety of metric, metrics which are expressing the reliability and potential uh, faultiness of, of the source code. So it was another field which was covered by the literature and hence we decided to exclude it from, from the overview we provide in the paper. And now I'm going to give you the brief summary of the metrics which are presented in the paper with particular definitions there. Here we have just some formulas as a samples here. I'm not going to read them because it's going to take a long time and you can find the exact definitions in the paper. So uh, just to give you some brief overview of what we are discussing in this consolidated view, let's start with this quality and reliability of the IoT system metrics, which are applicable for this, uh, for this general category. So we start with the availability of system or service. Then we discuss availability of data, which is provided uh, by some IoT system. Then some flaws over time, how frequently the bugs or uh, crashes of the system uh, happen during the system runtime, then the general reliability, then uh, functional correctness, how many bugs are present in, in the system, then mean time between failures, which adds time perspective to this, uh, to this measurement, then a rate of user error, how frequently the users of the system can do some wrong operation uh, with the system, then the responsiveness of the, uh, of the system under test 
and some suggestions for security as well. Then another set of metrics relates to performance of testing and debugging process. And here we start with uh, test to defect ratio, which uh, express how the test cases are actually effective in detecting the defects. Then test execution productivity, how the team is able to uh, execute the test. Then defect rejection rate, how much defects are rejected as a false arms or a wrongly or insufficiently specified. Then test scripting productivity, how fast the test team is in producting these test scripts during the test design phase. Then the requirement coverage, how big portion of the system requirements is covered by the test cases. Then we have the defect discovery versus defect fix rate, which express how fast the test team is in discovery of the defect versus the development team and the speed with which the development team is able to fix the defects which are reported by the testers. Then we have test execution rate, how fast we are able to, uh, to um, execute the test cases. Then when we are doing some regression tests, how much test cases we are able to reuse in this regression test. Then another important one, how much defects are reopened during the fixing phase. And then how much defects we will have in actual test cases, which can lead later to some false arms as well or missing the defects. And on top of these two categories, there are some overlapping metrics, which can be used uh, for the performance of the testing process, as well as uh, expressing the quality of the produced IoT system. Typically the defect leakage, which uh, measures how many defects are escaping one testing phase and are detected, uh, detected in uh, the second following testing phase and it can be applied even for transition from the last round of testing to the productive run of the, test, uh, of the system under test. And obviously in this production run, this defect leakage is highly undesirable because these defects which appear in the production run of the system are causing the troubles for the users and for the business we are doing with the IoT system. Then we have effective defect density, how then the defects are in the individual parts of uh, the tested system. Then how many defects are valid, like considered to be relevant by the development team and some suggestion of uh, general quality of code. But we don't go to this detailed topic uh, too much as we explained previously. So the full definitions of these uh, individual metrics with the full formulas and explanation of the symbols are the core of the paper. So if you are interested in, uh, in uh, more detail, just refer, uh, refer to the paper for the particular definitions. When we define these metrics, we also discuss some possible application limits and let's say side effects when we over apply these metrics, for instance, to express the KPIs of the team or individuals or in contractual conditions. Let's give some examples here. For instance, when we focus strictly on test scripting productivity, that means how much test cases we are able to create in time, it might lead to a higher amount of brief test cases and there is no time for in-depth analysis of the situations which have to be tested. So the people in the team are motivated to create just some brief test cases and to make some quantum of them to, uh, to fulfill these numbers. So they might not think too much about the quality of the test cases. So what happens then in the testing process? Actually, the number of the defects which can be detected during the testing process will be logically lower here. 
So when we over apply this metrics and we evaluate the team and the individuals uh, to just uh, create the quantum of the test scripts and the more test scripts the better, well, naturally it might impact the quality of the test cases and uh, the test cases are not going to be so so effective. So how to mitigate this situation? We need to have some metric which would balance this um, metric uh, test scripting productivity and it can be for instance test case review density when we do some review of the test cases we can uh, look for some uh, imperfections in the test cases and it could be some uh, some balance to this metric but honestly do we have the time to do the test case review every time on the project maybe not Sometimes we are happy even when we do the test cases at all on the project. So uh, maybe better metric to balance uh, this test scripting productivity would be test to defect ratio. How much these test cases are effective in detecting the actual defects here. Another example is test execution productivity here. When we evaluate the people based on the number of tests they have just passed, very likely it happen they will fake the tests. They will test fast, they will not hesitate about which and other possible combinations on scenarios can be taken. They will just forget their experience with the system and intuition. And it can also result in lower number of defects to be detected. When someone has experience from uh, testing in some large complex project and um, there were metric like this used as a KPI, very likely this effect might be in place in, in the real, real life testing. So as well, when we would like to evaluate the effectiveness of the process by test execution productivity, we need to balance this metric again by some another, another metric, which would be, uh, would be suitable. For instance, number of found relevant defects here. And as well, there is another case there are more examples in the discussion in the paper, but another classical case would be the number of defects. When the people will be uh, positively evaluated, like who has found the biggest number of the defects is the best tester, what would happen then? People would maybe report the false alarms, will be, will be reporting the duplicate defects, and actually maybe I'm a bit skeptical here if they are able to detect more defects actually because uh, the more relevant defects would arise from really thinking about the case and trying different test paths and uh, data combinations for instance. But instead of people are going to, uh, to report the applications uh, of the defects, not relevant defects, some minor things. And what happens actually when this amount of the defects will be burdened to, uh, to uh, the developers who need to fix the defects, they will just reject the defects and uh, the morale of the team will just go down and uh, it, it's not going to be a good situation. So when we are thinking about evaluating people for the number of the defects they have found during the testing process, we need to balance this uh, metric as well by the defect rejection rate, for instance to have this, uh, this process balanced and have some, uh, some good, uh, good value. And when we talk about this, uh, this metrics, there is one example uh, which can be given uh, as another metric which can be a bit misleading when uh, over applied. And it's line coverage in case of unit tests in the code, for instance because this line coverage is computed like a number of lines of the code which are executed by some unit test slash number of the total line of, uh, lines of the code. What's wrong with this metric? Well, it doesn't say anything how strong the unit test in terms of asserts, in terms of real detection of the defects. So when you have some unit tests and you don't have the asserts here, still you can have some 100 percent line coverage and you can guess how this unit test will be strong in detecting the defects when the 
system under test crashes on some exception, all right, the unit test will, cr will crash as well, but otherwise you don't know practically nothing about how strong these unit tests are and how many defects actually are in the system under test still having 100% line test coverage. So that's another example where we need to take some care about uh, about how to interpret and use this, uh, this metrics. But even despite all these possible limits which are there, the metrics are useful tools, definitely. And when well applied, they can help significantly in managing and reporting the test process and improving the process. So uh, these examples were just like how to use this metrics uh, reasonably, not to over apply, not to overdo it too much, but still apply it because they are very helpful in instilling the, the test process and improving the system. This overview of metrics is done as a part of larger project which prepares IoT test automation framework. So if you are in IoT business, this might be interesting for you. It's a joint project of our university and the Red Hat company funded by Technology Agency of the Czech Republic. And this framework prepared two basic parts, methodological part, which composes from the test strategy, test design techniques specific for IoT systems. These metrics we have discussed on various levels, some guidelines for test automation and so-called Patriot test automation framework, which is uh, based on open technologies and allows you to prepare effective uh, integration tests for various IoT systems. So if uh, you look for some test automation methodology and framework, this is one of the options which are available currently. So to conclude, uh, we have prepared some unified view on quality and reliability metrics specifically for IoT systems because some metrics has been published for software systems specifically, but for IoT systems there have been just individual papers so far discussing various viewpoints on different aspects of IoT system and no comprehensive paper has been published so far like in, in the style we, we, we did. So we provided a summary of 25 metrics in three categories dedicated to quality of the IoT system or service, then effectiveness of the testing process, and as well some set of metrics which can be universally applicable to both of these cases. So uh, this overview is available for you. It can be used by industry engineers who would like to measure the quality of the systems or optimize the uh, testing process. And it can be used as well as a base for further research here in this point. Yeah, of course, more metrics can be added. Some of them can be revised as well, but we believe this uh, 25 metrics in these three categories is a good start. And uh, when you go to the source literature in, in the paper, you can find more metrics as well, more inspiration how to measure the quality and uh, how to optimize the testing process. So we believe this, uh, this uh, review will be helpful for you. And if you have any questions to the set of metrics we have been talking about, as well as uh, the testing framework for IoT systems I have introduced, we would be happy to answer your questions.